energy source. As if sending children back to school during the pandemic was not enough for parents to worry about. In New Jersey today, a school bus carrying 15 students collided with multiple cars. Thankfully, none of the children were injured, despite the bus ending up on top of another car. Tonight, the bombshell book about the incredibly chaotic final days of the Trump administration. Our country's top general reportedly taking secret steps to secure the country's nuclear arsenal in case President Trump went rogue. General Mark Milley, according to the authors, was so fearful he made secret calls to his Chinese counterpart. It's all eyes on California tonight. Governor Gavin Newsom fighting for his political life. What's at stake in this rare recall? Tonight, Newsom's team is expressing major confidence in a victory, but his opponents are saying not so fast. President Biden now describing Newsom's main challenger, Larry Elder, as the clone of President Trump. Our team standing by in California at the ready for when the polls close. Tonight, Nicholas pounding parts of Louisiana still reeling from Hurricane Ida. Our Ginger Z has the latest track and which communities need to be on alert tonight. Three days in space without any professional astronauts on board. Tonight, the preps for SpaceX's out-of-this-world mission, the four civilians set to orbit Earth. Our Gio Benitez looks at the launch that could make history. On the Earth's surface, I weigh 175 pounds. Up here, zero. Remembering Saturday Night Live legend Norm MacDonald, the tributes coming in for the accomplished actor. And tonight, it's curtains up on Broadway. For the first time in a year and a half, the major shows opening up tonight to fans. How do you expect to feel when you step out on stage and see an audience for the first time in forever? I don't know if I'm going to break and fall my eyes out on stage or if adrenaline will just shoot right through me. I'm excited. Lots of excitement. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with that high stakes California recall election. Polls are now closed in America's most populous state. And ABC News does not yet have enough information to project whether or not California Governor Gavin Newsom has been recalled. But based on exit poll information, we can say that not recalling him has been the leading response. All day, last minute voters turned out across the state of roughly 40 40 million people to make sure their voices were heard. Voters had until 8 p.m. Pacific time to vote on whether Newsom should be removed from office. The referendum on Governor Gavin Newsom is one of the first big indicators of the country's political direction since President Biden took office in January. If they decided yes, he should be recalled, then a field of 46 candidates is vying to replace him. His top challenger, Larry Elder, has promised to end all COVID mandates if he's elected, but he's already casting doubt on the election results before they're even known. We're getting early exit polls in, and our team is standing by tonight to break down the race, what the campaigns are saying right now, and what comes next. We begin with Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman. After the fight of his political life, tonight, Governor Gavin Newsom sounding confident he won't be fired by the voters of California. So what are we going to do? We will turn out and vote no on this recall. Do I have your support to vote no? In the closing hours, Newsom tried to turn the race into a referendum on the leading Republican candidate to replace him, conservative radio host Larry Elder. If we don't reject this recall, Larry Elder is the next governor of the state of California. <laughs> I'm going to sound like Obama. Don't boo. Vote. President Biden hammering that same message. He's the clone of Donald Trump. Can you imagine him being governor of this state? Elder is taking a page out of the Trump playbook, already making baseless claims of election fraud before all the votes are even cast. His campaign launching a Stop California Fraud website, essentially saying he had lost and blaming the, quote, twisted results of this 2021 recall election. But when the website was launched, not a single result had yet been reported. Still, Elder's website cites what they call statistical analysis, claiming to have detected fraud in California, resulting in Governor Gavin Newsom being reinstated as governor. And when I pressed Elder, he repeatedly ducked the question. Is there any evidence of voter fraud? Come on! 
Today, Newsom on the attack. Stop. Grow up, you. These people literally are vandalizing our democracy and trust in our institutions. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, we appreciate you trying to get those answers on that rope line there. And this recall really came about in large part because of questions over the governor's handling of the pandemic. But right now, California is doing relatively well in containing COVID. So how's that impacting the race? Uh, apparently very strongly. Uh, the exit polls are very supportive of Newsom. This is a key statistic that we came across. Just three in 10 California voters say that Newsom's pandemic restrictions were too strict. That is huge given that this entire recall, $276 million in California taxpayer money, was essentially a referendum on his handling of COVID. Critics said he shut down the state too soon, too harshly, that the measures were too strict. But that is not apparently what California voters are saying when they are leaving the polls. A couple of other statistics that are very important right now. I'm going to read them so I don't mess them up. California is the lowest nationally per capita weekly COVID-19 cases, tied for second nationally in lowest uh, death rates per capita, and is the only state not to, ha to have a, a less than high level of community transmission. Those are very important statistics for Newsom. It is proof that what he has done in this state has worked in terms of COVID. Lindsay. And we saw those election integrity questions raised by the elder campaign. You're at a ballot processing center there in Orange County. What are you seeing on the ground as far as the security measures they have in place? Well, I'm going to show you right now. You see there's a, a pair of sheriff's deputies. I'll have Jeff, our cameraman, pan to them. There's another sheriff's deputy right behind me. Now, when we first arrived, Lindsay, we thought that these folks are here to secure the ballots that you see being wheeled in on this conveyor belt. They just started arriving about six minutes ago. But no, we were told by the registrar of voters, basically the head of the elections here in Orange County, that those folks are here to actually secure the workers because tension has become so high, they are increasingly concerned for their own safety here. Uh, and that registrar also said there have been no um, incidences of fraud on any significant level. Yes, here and there, but it takes hundreds of thousands of votes to actually sway an election like this. There is absolutely no indication that that is the case, despite the allegations and rumors by people like uh, former President Trump and uh, Larry Elder. Lindsay. Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. And now let's turn to ABC's Zareen Shaw, who joins us now live from Sacramento. Zareen, what are you hearing from Governor Newsom's camp as far as his confidence level as we head into these late night hours? Hi, Lindsay. I've been, sp I've been speaking to Newsom staffers all day long, and they are projecting high confidence. I spoke to one of his, his top strategists just earlier this morning, and he says, look, the takeaway is going to be that this governor was bold on COVID. Now, of course, we don't know exactly how this race is going to turn out, but experts say that this, that COVID was actually what got him into this mess, and they believe it could actually get him out. Like, we were in a, in a bad shape just a few months ago. Those COVID rates were incredibly high, and Newsom staffers, when they looked at the landscape here in California, they noticed that they didn't have an awareness issue, they say. They say they had a persuasion issue. So they went ahead spending millions of dollars trying to get people to know that there was a recall race here today. They spent millions of dollars texting people, calling people, and bringing out those big heavy hitters. You saw those Barack Obama and those Bernie ads. You saw Biden last night in Long Beach campaigning for the governor. And then he brought out several senators and the vice president as well. And that started closing the gap. And you also saw a massive turnout. I mean, a 30 percent just a couple days ago of ballots already in. And so that is one of the reasons why they're projecting a lot of confidence tonight, Lindsay. And I saw a note from you, Zoreen. It seems like you are expecting Governor Newsom to uh, speak at some point tonight now that the polls are closed. He's just a couple miles away. He's been watching the returns with his family or he will be. And we expect him to speak. But it just really depends on what those numbers are, Lindsay. And how has he been able to make the race in recent weeks as much a referendum on Larry Elder as it was on his own job as governor? 
Larry Elder is such an interesting character here. You know, I spoke to his top strategist just earlier today who basically talks about Larry Elder and, and comparing him to Trump. He says, look, we presented a clear choice to voters. He says they presented two doors. One of them was sanity. What behind the other one was Trump. And then you heard about what Biden said last night in Long Beach. He talked about Trump on and on and on. It, it was as if Trump was on the ballot. Today, he mentioned him about a dozen times, both him and Newsom, and they barely even mentioned Larry Elder's name. Look, I spoke to Arnold Schwarzenegger's top comms director from 2003. As we know, he won that race. He says Larry Elder was a gift to Newsom, and he says Larry Elder was the best thing to happen to Newsom since his hair gel. Look, he really caused that gap to close in the polling. At least that's what we saw when Larry Elder entered that race. It wasn't so close anymore for Newsom. You saw Larry Elder Shore at 26 percent leading behind the other, cal other candidates by double digits. But Newsom's poll numbers started to go up as well. Lindsay. And Larry Elder already signaling if he doesn't win tonight, he may run again next year. Uh, so we'll see. Zareen Shaw, our thanks to you. For more on the California recall race and the ongoing battles in Washington, we are joined now by Democratic Congresswoman Karen Bass of California. Thank you so much for being here, Congresswoman. First on the recall election, where do you think this race stands tonight? Are you confident that Governor Newsom will get the turnout and support he needs to keep his job? Well, so far, it is looking like that. I am very, very hopeful. There's no reason for us to think there's going to be some massive upsurge of Republican ballots coming in. And so, so far, I feel good. Again, taking absolutely nothing for granted. So we're going to be doing calls and contacting people up until the time the polls close. And hey, what's your opinion? Is it too easy to recall public officials in California? Yes. Absolutely. The process absolutely needs to be reformed on every level of government. Do you know that there's over 68 recalls going on on every single level? School board, county commissioner, city council, district attorney, you name it. And there are recalls happening all around the state. And I think we need to take a serious look at this. We need to take a look at how easy it is to recall someone. Then we also need to see who's behind it all. And going forward, do you think that there is enough political will in order to change how this happens in California? I, I believe so. I believe so on a state level and on a local level, because really, this could be, and I don't know this, but this could be a strategy to essentially grind government to a halt, to paralyze government. And so I think that that's what we have to take a look at. I know that I'm very interested in analyzing who started all these recalls, who's funding them, because you can't just recall someone without financial backing, significant financial backing. Republican Larry Elder has emerged as the front runner on the GOP side, and, and we've seen him already raise doubts about this election's integrity even before the results are known. So how do Democrats respond to that, these kinds of claims? Or do you not? Do you just ignore them altogether? Oh, absolutely not. We cannot ignore them. But I do think that we need to look at it within the national context. Because there is an undermining of the confidence of the election process nationally. Of course, it started with uh, President Trump, uh, what he did on Election Day. And so now we're questioning the integrity of our election system. And this is so ironic. For somebody like me who focuses on foreign affairs in Congress, we go around the world talking about the strength of our democracy. And then people see all around the country and around the world us questioning the very institution. So I believe that what is behind it is the fact that the Republican Party is using this as a strategy. You don't hear Democrats raising big questions about the integrity of elections. And mind you, the only time Republicans are raising questions about the integrity of elections is when they lose. <laughs> and let's turn now to Washington and some ongoing debates there. Today, Senate Democrats introduced the latest version of a sweeping election reform bill. A and this one has the support of Senator Joe Manchin, who had opposed prior voting legislation. So is this new Freedom to Vote Act outlined today something that you and House Democrats can get behind if, the pa if the, it gets passed in the Senate? Well, I certainly need to take a look at it because it was introduced in the Senate and the House is not in session, but I will tell you, if they have reached a compromise and if it can stop 
the voter suppression that is taking place now that is underway in states around the country, if it can stop what is going on specifically in Georgia, where they essentially purge the roles of voters, and then if they don't like the outcome of the election, they can remove the officials who are in charge of elections. So they are setting the stage, not just for voter uh, suppression, but to actually overturn the outcome of elections when they don't like it. If it addresses that, then I am all for it. But we do still have the issue of the filibuster. The question is, number one, whether or not Republicans will come on board, and if not, whether Democrats can compromise around the filibuster and get this done, which I think think we need to use every tool in our toolbox to do this. The right to vote in this country is an existential question. And Congresswoman, you've been on the show several times this year and have expressed optimism about reaching a deal with Republicans on criminal justice reform. So far, that hasn't happened yet. Is that effort just completely stalled at this point? Where do things stand? Well, first of all, it's, it's on the specific issue of policing. We actually do have bipartisan support for many aspects of criminal justice reform. But I will tell you that my fingers are crossed. Uh, we met over the weekend, and I'm hoping to hear from Senator Scott uh, today or tomorrow about his uh, reaction to where we are right now. So theory is, if he will agree, because Senator Booker and I have agreed, if he will agree, then maybe there will be legislation that could come forward next week. But that is a big question, if. Oh, potentially as soon as next week. If you're a betting woman, are you thinking before the end of the calendar year for sure? Uh, well, I mean, I think, frankly, it's, it's critical that we do this. We turned out hundreds of thousands of voters in the last election with the promise that we were going to get voting rights done and police reform done. So far, it looks like voting rights, hopefully, will move along. We need to deliver on police reform. So why should voters have faith in Democrats on issues like voting reform and criminal justice reform when we haven't yet seen major changes while Democrats have been in control of the House, the Senate, and the White House? Well, you know, it's incumbent upon elected officials like myself to bring the public along as well so that they understand that we can pass what we want out of the House, but in the Senate, we still have this issue of the filibuster. And I'm hoping that we have some filibuster reform because we can't be held hostage by the minority party, which is exactly what is happening in the Senate. Not so in the House, but in the Senate. So I have to make sure that voters understand it is not enough to win the majority by one seat, which, frankly, that's because of the vice president, that we have any semblance of a majority in the Senate, but that we have to win many, many more seats. So I'm hoping that people will see how close we got and why we have to turn out in such big numbers next year so that we can finish what we started last year. And lastly, Congresswoman, let's just talk quickly about the debates on infrastructure and spending. Progressive House Democrats have stood by their position that they will not support the smaller infrastructure bill without also getting a vote on the larger proposed $3.5 trillion spending package. But it seems clear that it can't get through the Senate at that larger price tag. Are you willing to potentially risk not getting anything passed at all on infrastructure? Well, no, I'm not willing to risk that, but I'm also not willing to concede the 3.5. And so we have to see where Manchin goes. I know what he said, but maybe there are some things that he needs to have in that bill for his state. You know, it often works like that. Uh, Speaker Pelosi is still sticking to 3.5 and doing both bills together, and I'm sticking with her. California Congresswoman Karen Bass, thank you once again for your time. Appreciate your insight. Thank you. And for more on the California recall, let's bring in ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper. So, Avery, the polls are now closed. We have some exit polling data in from voters in California. What stands out to you in particular tonight? Well, there's quite a bit that stands out to me. The first is the fact that only uh, three in 10 Californians uh, say that Governor Gavin Newsom's COVID protocols, uh, that they were too strict. Uh, and that's really glaring to me for uh, a specific reason. Uh, Newsom's handling of the pandemic was really uh, a catalyst for Republican organizers as they set out to get the, the ball rolling on uh, this recall. Another thing that stands out to me is the fact that uh, most of those who were uh, surveyed uh, 
in these exit polls say that they're on the governor's side when it comes to some of those uh, COVID-19 safety measures. 69% uh, say that they support student uh, mask mandates. 63% uh, saying that they think that vaccination is uh, a public health responsibility rather than a, a personal choice. And that's really in direct contrast from uh, the Republican frontrunner, uh, Larry Elder, that uh, radio host. Uh, and uh, lastly, it's the fact that preliminary uh, results show that Democrats outnumbered uh, Republicans at the polls by 17 percentage points. And, and we do know, uh, just from our knowledge of the electorate, that Democrats outnumber Republicans two to one in the state of California. But there were worries that uh, Democrats were not going to come out in numbers in order to keep uh, Governor Newsom in the governor's mansion. And so that's something that the uh, Newsom team can be uh, confident in tonight. And, and explain how the vote is coming in tonight and, and how that might impact the results that we see. Right. And so we know that polls are closed and we're watching those results come in. We're going to be watching them for uh, quite some time. Uh, we know that uh, based on uh, the exit polls that no is currently leading uh, in the race, but uh, no one knows what is going to happen. And so we're going to continue to watch that. Uh, uh, one thing that we do anticipate is for uh, things to swing in the direction of, of Gavin Newsom's favor uh, initially because uh, they're going to be counting those mail-in ballots and some of that rhetoric from Republicans uh, on mail-in ballots has likely uh, probably discouraged some of those uh, folks from coming out and, and voting early in, in that way. Uh, another thing that we're going to be looking at a little later on is the impact of the in-person votes, right? Uh, we think that those could uh, trend right, trend red, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, giving the, the Newsom team a little bit to worry about. Uh, we call that the so-called red mirage. And then uh, if you're uh, Governor Newsom's team, you're hoping that things swing back in your direction. But again, uh, no one knows what's going to happen for certain. So that's just something that we have to continue to watch as those results come in. Right. And as you say, no one knows for certain what's going to happen. How long until we know? What do you think that the timeline is until we kind of have some definitive idea of the winner? Right. Well, it could be a, a couple of hours. We're going to see a steady stream of results coming in uh, from some of the bigger uh, precincts and the bigger counties uh, to all some of those really, really small counties. Uh, and then or it could be a couple of days. Uh, you know, we plan to be up and watching those results come in for uh, the entire night uh, just to see what happens until we can make a projection. But uh, there is no crystal ball on this. And, and lastly, just lay out the stakes in this race for Democrats and what it could mean for the state of California if Newsom is recalled. Right. So uh, this could have a national impact, right? Uh, the fact is that whoever uh, is the governor, should there be a Senate vacancy, right, uh, the governor uh, is the person who could uh, replace uh, or, or fill that vacancy uh, in the Senate. And uh, if that happens and it's a Republican governor, uh, that could uh, change the, the control in the Senate, right? Uh, that could mean that Republicans now control the chamber and that could spell trouble for Biden and his agenda. Good point there. Avery Harper, the night is still very young. We know that we'll, we'll be getting updates from you throughout the evening. I appreciate that. Our deputy political director here at ABC News, thanks so much. Now to the new book about the final days of the Trump presidency. In the book by Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Robert Costa called Peril, they report the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, took secret steps to prevent President Trump from potentially launching a military strike or a nuclear launch, and that the top general called his counterpart in China. And we're learning tonight what he reportedly assured China the U.S. would not do. Here's Jonathan Carl. In their soon-to-be-released book, Peril, Bob Woodward and Robert Costa report that China was so concerned about Donald Trump's behavior in the final days of the 2020 presidential campaign that Joint Chiefs Chairman General Mark Milley took the extraordinary step of secretly reaching out directly to China's top general. General Lee, I want to assure you that the American government is stable and everything is going to be okay, Milley told him according to the book. We are not going to attack or conduct any kinetic operations against you. One reason for China's concerns, Trump's incendiary words about China and coronavirus. There's a plague coming over from China. Here it comes. What a disgrace. What a disgrace. Milley told the Chinese general not to worry. If we're going to attack, I'm going to call you ahead of time. It's not going to be a surprise. And after the January 6th Capitol riot, Milley called the Chinese general again, telling him, quote, 
We are 100% steady. Everything is fine, but democracy can be sloppy sometimes. Shortly after the riot, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi called Milley alarmed that Trump was both unstable and dangerous. Milley tried to reassure her, saying there are, quote, a lot of checks in the system. According to a transcript of the call obtained by Woodward and Costa, Pelosi responded, quote, he's crazy. You know he's crazy. He's crazy, and what he did yesterday is further evidence of his craziness. Milley replied, I agree with you on everything. Milley, the author's right, was certain Trump had gone into serious mental decline. During a meeting at the Pentagon, according to the book, Milley, who is actually not in the chain of command, told the top military leadership they were not to sign off on any order to use nuclear weapons without his sign-off. No matter what you are told, you do the procedure, Milley told them. You do the process, and I'm part of that procedure. According to the book, Milley looked everyone in the eye and asked each one of them to say they agreed. Really fascinating to hear those details about the level of concern there. Jonathan Carl joins us. And, John, you've certainly seen a lot uh, during your years covering President Trump and, of course, over your decades as a journalist. Taking a step back here, how do these claims land with you and also with Bob Woodward, who's so famous for breaking the Watergate scandal? Well, it's just extraordinary because you have to consider what General Milley's job is. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs is not somebody that's actually in the chain of command. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is actually the top military advisor to the President of the United States. So here you have the President's top military advisor uh, fearful that he might do something so erratic uh, that he went to these extraordinary steps of actually reaching directly to the Chinese, reaching out twice to China's top general. And then that moment uh, that Woodward describes of uh, Milley with the top military leadership at the Pentagon going around and telling them that if there is a request to launch a nuclear strike, uh, that they must remember that there is a process and that he is part of the process. Basically, the implication being you don't do anything before talking to me. And it, the, the actual truth of it is that there is a process, and in that case, the, the President of the United States doesn't need his chairman of the Joint Chiefs to launch a nuclear strike. He's not in the military chain of command. So it was effectively Milley stepping in to try to prevent Trump from doing something that he was fearful was at least possible uh, that he would try to do. And tell us about President Trump's reaction to this tonight. Uh, the president gave an interview with Newsmax, with his former uh, press secretary, and said that if it is actually true uh, that, that Milley reached out to the Chinese and, quote, was willing to advise them of an attack or in advance of an attack, that's treason. Uh, Trump also said that the idea that he was going to attack the Chinese, quote, is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. But keep in mind, uh, Lindsay, that the book uh, also says that uh, Perhaps, obviously, Milley never told uh, Trump about his conversations with the Chinese or that he had reached out to China's top general. And as for Milley, he has offered no comment yet uh, to what's reported in the Woodward and Costa book. Really interesting stuff. Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Now to the latest on COVID and the dangerous surge of cases in children. Tonight, we're getting a clearer picture of when we can expect vaccines for kids and whether booster shots will be recommended for the rest of us. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. For millions of parents eager to know how soon their younger children could finally get a vaccine, tonight, a clearer picture. Pfizer today revealing it will submit data from its trial for 5 to 11-year-olds to the FDA in early October, followed by trial data for children 6 months to 5 years old in the weeks after. Dr. Anthony Fauci expects the FDA to authorize the first shots for elementary age kids as early as mid-October. I believe it will work out this way, that by the time we get to the mid-fall, October or so, that we will have the, the capability of giving vaccines for Pfizer. We met the Bowie family in New Orleans when all three children took part in Pfizer's vaccine trial at Oshner Health. Both parents are doctors. Six-year-old Ellie, three-year-old Christian, and 14-month-old Sloan getting shots. We're not 100% sure that the kids got the vaccine yet, um, but just knowing that they have a chance and that they have that little extra layer of protection 
makes me much more at ease with sending them back to school. Tens of millions of children are back in classrooms, but less than 40% of 12 to 17 year olds who are eligible for the vaccine are fully vaccinated. In Ohio, cases spiking 2000% since early August. Hospitals are full. All of our children's hospitals are overwhelmed. Across the country, children making up almost 30% of COVID cases last week. And after two top scientists who are leaving the FDA argued in the Lancet, it was premature to give boosters to the general public because the vaccines offer strong protection against serious disease. Dr. Fauci today pushing back. You have clearly waning of immunity against infection and clear cut indication of waning of immunity against severe disease. And he expects the FDA advisory panel to support boosters when it reviews the data on Friday. Myself as a scientist who have seen some of the data, I believe when you look at that data carefully, there's going to be a decision to actually give the boost as opposed to not giving it. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. And Stephanie, we just heard Dr. Fauci predicting the FDA will eventually greenlight these boosters and word tonight that the UK is already moving in that direction. Exactly, Lindsay. It's part of their winter strategy. Britain will give boosters to people over the age of 50, starting with older people, healthcare workers, and those with underlying conditions. Now, the government says the primary choice is the Pfizer booster shot, regardless of what vaccine was originally given. Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. Now to the tropical threat dumping inches of rain onto some of the very same communities devastated by Hurricane Ida not long ago. Our Victor Akendo is in New Orleans for us tonight. Hurricane Nicholas hammering the Texas coast in the middle of the night. Rapidly intensifying into a category one hurricane just before landfall south of Houston. The powerful storm surge overtaking roads winds rocking this gas station canopy before sending it crashing into the ground. KTRK's Ted Oberg in the thick of it. This rain not only looks like it's coming in sideways, I can tell you down here it is coming in sideways. Just uh, torrential rain. With daybreak, Nicholas's wrath coming into view, revealing homes ripped apart, parts of roads washed away. Winds snapping the blades off this turbine. Our Marcus Moore is outside Houston. The power has been knocked out to so many people across the region. Now crews are working around the clock to get those services back online. The storm now threatening to dump up to 20 inches of rain across Louisiana, where many homes are covered with blue tarps, damaged by Hurricane Ida just over two weeks ago. Families still cleaning up as the new storm moves in. We've been trying to just pick up what we can, but now we have this other storm coming. It's not helping at all. Our thanks to Victor for that. And now let's get right to our Ginger Z, who is in Laplace, Louisiana, a community that bore the brunt of Ida not too long ago and is now getting pounded again. Ginger, time this storm out for us tonight. So, Lindsay, it's been 16 days, and these folks still have towering piles of what was the content of their lives. And that's not just this home, but homes all the way down this street and several other streets that we've driven already in Laplace. You see blue tarps on roofs. You see and smell the destruction from a storm more about a half a month ago. And so now we're talking about a flash flood watch here again from another storm, Nicholas. And that's what we're tracking here tonight. The heaviest rain will move through southeastern Louisiana into early tomorrow morning. Then it'll become more scattered in nature. So tonight's really the, the crux of it here. But if you're in Mobile or Biloxi over to Pensacola and Destin, you've got it tonight in through tomorrow. And then we're going to keep pulling in moisture. Uh, that tropical moisture doesn't stop and the circulation is going to be slow to move. What that ends up meaning when you talk beyond timing is what does it add up to? We're on Unfortunately, could we unfortunately could see 10 to 20 inches in a place like Slidell over to Purlington, Mississippi, but that widespread half foot is where we think we may end up seeing problems, especially overnight tonight. And I'd love to tell you that there's nothing on the map, but hey, we just passed the peak of hurricane season. So there are two areas of interest, one of them a 90% shot that will likely become Odette pretty soon. And Ginger, just seeing the, the drone shot there, as you call it, the, the piles of, of what once was and now uh, this peril that the, the same poor people are about to mm -hmm. go through again, the tropics certainly is slowing, showing no signs of slowing down this season. What happens when we run out of names? 
Yeah, well, that's the thing is, I, you know, we've had three major hurricanes make landfall in Louisiana alone, and you've had so many. We're already, you saw the list there where Odette is next. We've only got a couple left in the list that is already set up. Now, last year we went, we blew through that. We've got 21 new names because they're not going to use the Greek alphabet again. We're going to go into a new list of names because this is our new normal. Lindsay. Unfortunately. Okay, Ginger Z, our thanks to you. And when we come back, Kim Kardashian raised some eyebrows for her attire during last night's Met Gala, but some of her neighbors back in California are at war with her for an entirely different reason. It will explain. The deadly drone strike in the final days of the chaotic Afghanistan withdrawal. The Pentagon initially said the target was a suspected ISIS-K terrorist, but we speak to the victim's brother and his employer, a California NGO who paint a heartbreaking picture of a terrible mistake. But up next, yet a Another billionaire sending civilians to space, and critics say tomorrow's launch is the riskiest and most audacious yet. Did we mention it's also historic? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. Next to the space flight set to make history around this time tomorrow, if all goes according to plan, SpaceX is sending four civilians into orbit without any astronauts. But that's not the only reason that this launch is expected to be history-making. ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez is at the Kennedy Space Center with more. Tonight, SpaceX prepping to launch an all-civilian crew into orbit, what could be its most groundbreaking launch yet. Four civilians are set to orbit the Earth with no professional astronauts on board, going farther than any other private citizen has ever gone for three days. SpaceX was founded on the belief that a future where humanity is out exploring the stars is more exciting than a life where we're not. The mission, funded by Jared Isaacman, a 38-year-old billionaire who bought four seats, which typically sell at $55 million each for an undisclosed amount, giving three away to fundraise for St. Jude Children's Hospital. Getting a seat, engineer and Air Force vet Chris Zembrowski, geoscience professor Dr. Cyan Proctor, and Haley Arsenault. 
as a child. She was a patient at St. Jude. Now she works there. The fact that I'm going to be the youngest American in space really is just absolutely mind-blowing to me. And Dr. Proctor will become just the fourth black American woman to go to space. I have this opportunity to not only um, accomplish my dream, but also inspire and inspire the next generation. Lift off. This launch just months after these high stakes flights. Um, and we'll be to space. <laughs> excuse us, excuse us. Yes, got those wings. Three, two, one, release, release, release. Virgin Galactic's Richard Branson, the first to launch his own spaceship to the edge of the atmosphere. What did you hear? What did you feel when that rocket ignited? Um, you could hear the roar of the rocket pinned into your seat. You're going straight up, going from 0 to 3,000 miles an hour in seven or eight seconds. Jeff Bezos lifting off a week later with his company, Blue Origin. <laughs> These billionaire space flights are not without controversy and criticism. Beyond the spectacle, some question its timing and safety. When you hear that criticism from folks who say these are just joy rides for very rich people, what do you say? Well, I would say that uh, if I go right back to when I was a child, uh, I started with uh, $200, and that $200 has now built a space company, has employed hundreds of wonderful engineers and scientists, and that technology will trans help transform the Earth. Tomorrow's SpaceX flight is risky. SpaceX, which was founded by another billionaire, Elon Musk, has never sent its crew dragon this far into space, 360 miles above the Earth's surface, way farther than Branson and Bezos, and even the International Space Station. The only thing that's different here on this Dragon capsule is they took the docking mechanism that uh, would normally connect into the International Space Station, and they put that that cupola, this this beautiful uh, ability to to look around when they're uh, up in space. So I, I think that's the, really the only change. Other than that, that whole Dragon capsule is the same one that NASA certified and flew their own astronauts on. Virgin Galactic was grounded by the FAA after it learned the rocket had left its planned route for almost two minutes. It is now under investigation by the FAA. Virgin Galactic telling ABC News that high altitude winds changed the ship's trajectory, adding that at no time were passengers and crew put in any danger as a result of this change in trajectory. And at no time did the ship travel above any population centers or cause a hazard to the public. We will continue working closely with the FAA. They want to sort of be seen as this luxury brand catering to, to you know, to, to the rich and famous, but they are still very much in the, in the test phase of the program. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, also criticized for funding a spaceflight program after a bombshell ProPublica report alleging wealthy individuals legally avoided paying their fair share of taxes. I think that even the cynical people and even people who shrugged and said, yeah, sure, we know that wealthy people don't pay a lot of taxes. I hope they were shocked today to learn that Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, had two years recently, 2007 and 2011, when he was a billionaire and he paid zero in taxes. And Elon Musk in 2018, zero in federal income taxes. Bezos thanking his workers and his customers after the Blue Origin launch. I also I want to thank uh, every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all of this. <laughs> But despite these concerns, experts say the SpaceX program stands alone among its peers. What Elon Musk has done is to, uh, to create this new Starship rocket and the Falcon 9 rockets that he's doing now to have a very reliable way to get things into space very cheaply. And that is going to be critical. To get ready for weightlessness, the SpaceX crew boarded the Zero-G plane here on Earth. And so did we. This is how astronauts train. Wow. On the Earth's surface. I weigh 175 pounds. Up here, zero. Zero G inviting us on as pilots fly the plane in specific maneuvers to replicate the microgravity of space. Oh. 
that feeling of being in zero gravity is so unique and undescribable. And you don't want that first experience to be when you're you know, in space and things like that, you'll be disoriented. Now you might be asking, why is any of this important? Well, Elon Musk has said that he wants humans to eventually have a second home on Mars and that this is a first step to get there. So this launch is scheduled for tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern, and we will be right there. Lindsay? Our thanks to Geo. Look like a fun assignment there. You can catch that historic SpaceX launch right here on ABC News Live. Geo and the team will be joining us. Our coverage starts around 7.30 Eastern tomorrow. Still ahead here on Prime, the former officers charged with violating George Floyd's civil rights appear before a federal judge. Broadway is back and will take you to the latest sign of America reopening. And why poverty by one important measure actually dropped during the pandemic. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Comedian Seth Rogen echoing so many others in their shock and sadness about the news that Norm McDonald passed away. The comedian privately battled cancer for nine years. He was 61 years old. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Welcome back, everyone. Now to some surprising findings by the Census Bureau released today. The official U.S. poverty rate rose in 2020 amid the pandemic shutdowns, but the massive relief efforts like stimulus and unemployment aid staved off much of the hardship and by one measure caused an overall drop in poverty. Here's a closer look by the numbers. 67,521. That was the U.S. median income in 2020, a nearly 3% drop from 2019, making it the first statistically significant income decline in almost a decade. 11.4%, that was the official U.S. poverty rate in 2020, up one percentage point from 2019. Roughly 37 million Americans now live in poverty, about 3 million more than in 2019. But here's a caveat to that data. 9.1%, that's the so-called supplemental poverty measure that factors in stimulus payments and other relief. And by that accounting, the poverty rate has dropped 2.6% 
percentage points from 2019 and is now at its lowest since estimates began in 2009. The Census Bureau said today that the stimulus payments from the nearly three and a half trillion dollars in COVID-19 relief pulled nearly 12 million Americans out of poverty in 2020. And without that aid, the poverty rate could be much higher. And we still have lots ahead here on Prime tonight. The emergency software update released by Apple will explain the major flaw that gave hackers potential access to your device without even clicking on a link. And Supreme Court Justice Breyer, what he had to say about the new Texas law targeting abortions. But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richie. We tell all our patients how much they're loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier Podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb control. shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. With daybreak, Nicholas's wrath coming into view, revealing homes ripped apart, parts of roads washed away, winds snapping the blades off this turbine. Marcus Moore is outside Houston. The power has been knocked out to so many people across the region. Now crews are working around the clock to get those services back online. The storm now threatening to dump up to 20 inches of rain across Louisiana, where many homes are covered with blue tarps, damaged by Hurricane Ida just over two weeks ago. Apple has launched an emergency software update for its products after it discovered that Israeli spyware could infect iPhones, Macs, iPads, and Apple Watches without even a click. This comes on the heels of Apple's new launch event today, where they unveiled new Apple Watches featuring larger screens and the iPhone 13, where for the first time the Pro version can come with one terabyte of storage. Four former Minneapolis police officers were arraigned in federal court today on charges they violated George Floyd's civil rights. All four pleaded not guilty. Federal grand jury had indicted Derek Chauvin, Thomas Lane, Jay Kung, and Tu Tao back in May for allegedly depriving Floyd of his rights when they failed to provide him with medical care. Floyd was handcuffed and held face down by Chauvin. Floyd's death led to worldwide protests and calls for police reform. 
In an interview with George Stephanopoulos, Justice Stephen Breyer said the Supreme Court's decision allowing Texas to effectively ban abortion across the state was very bad, but not politically motivated. I thought that that was a very bad decision, and I dissented. A rule of law means you sometimes follow decisions you don't like. He also said he's thinking about retirement, but gave no word on timing. There are many different considerations and uh, that I do not intend to die there on the court. I, I hope not. A plea for help. Gabby Petito's family looking for any clues as to what happened to the 22-year-old who was on a cross-country adventure with her boyfriend when she disappeared. We don't know where she is. A few days is one thing when you're out camping, but um, when it starts to become seven, eight, nine, ten days, that's, that's a problem. The New York native was last seen on August 24th checking out of a hotel with laundry in Salt Lake City, Utah. Her mother said she last spoke to her by phone the next day. She told her they were in Grand Teton, Wyoming on their way to Yellowstone National Park. The Met Gala returning after a delay from the pandemic with the star power coming out in full force. I'm just here for the boo and for the vibrations. I'm here for all that. The evening starting out with a bang, literally. The theme, celebrating American fashion. Two congresswomen from New York using fashion for political messaging. How do we show up as two working class women of color at the Met Gala? And we said, if we're gonna do it, then we have to send a message. And so, tag the rich. Kim Kardashian. Suppression. We said yes to women's fundamental constitutional right to decide for herself what she does with her body, her fate and future. We said yes to diversity. We said yes to inclusion. We said yes to pluralism. We said yes to all those things that we hold dear as Californians and I would argue as Americans, economic justice, social justice, racial justice, environmental justice, our values where California has made so much progress. All of those things were on the ballot this evening. And so I'm humbled and grateful to the millions and millions of Californians that exercise their fundamental right to vote and express themselves so overwhelmingly by rejecting the division, by rejecting the cynicism, by rejecting so much of the negativity that's defined our politics in this country over the course of so many years. I just think of our kids watching all of this, nightly news, day in and day out. And I just wonder, you know, I've got four young kids, oldest about to turn 12 this weekend, and what they're growing up to. In a, in a world where we're so divided, these kids increasingly fearful, isolated, disconnected, and we're teaching them that. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think we owe our kids a, a deeper sense of respect and all of us as adults a responsibility to, to, to disregard this false separateness. We're so much more in common as a state and a nation that we give ourselves credit for. I've been all over the state of California over the last many years, but notably the last nine months conservative parts of the state, progressive parts of the state, folks that I, I know were going to vote no, and folks that I knew were going to vote yes on this recall and, and turned out to do just that. But one thing that's universal, everybody wants to be respected. Everyone wants to feel some connection to one another. We all certainly in this pandemic want to feel safe, protected. And those are universal values. And I think about just in the last you know, few days and the former president put out saying this election was rigged. You know, democracy is not a football. You don't throw it around. It's more like a, I don't know, antique vase. You can <laughs> drop it and smash it in a million different pieces. And that's what we're capable of doing if we don't stand up to meet the moment and push back. I, I said this many, many times on the campaign trail. You know, we may have defeated Trump, but Trumpism is not dead in this country. 
the big lie, the January 6th insurrection, all the voting suppression efforts that are happening all across this country, what's happening, the assault on fundamental rights, constitutionally protected rights of women and girls. It's a remarkable moment in our nation's history. But I'm reminded of uh, something, I don't know, a few decades ago someone told me when describing a difficult and challenging moment, said, the world is too small, our time is too short, and our wisdom is too limited to win fleeting victories at other people's expenses. And he went on to say, we must all triumph together. So in that spirit of recognizing and reconciling this moment and trying to understand what's going on, not just here in the state, but all across the United States of America. I just want to say this. Tonight, I'm humbled, grateful, but resolved in the spirit of my political hero, Robert Kennedy, to make more gentle the life of this world. Thank you all very much, and thank you to 40 million Americans, 40 million Californians, and thank you for rejecting this recall. Governor, Good night, everybody. Governor, 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 the president win tonight. Governor, did Governor, Anthony Couch win tonight? Answer the question. No way. Nathan, Thanks, you answer that. <laughs> <laughs>
Billings has a population of less than 200,000 people, but its unemployment rate hovers around 3%, lower than the national average. There's a lot of great things that Billings has going for it. It's just beginning to be discovered. Husband and wife realtors Megan and Jason Woods sold the Elwoods their house. Living in Billings and living in South Central Montana is all about being close to the mountains and having the access to the river and the desert and some of the other nice outdoor activities. Like many mid-sized cities, Billings is experiencing a pandemic real estate boom. Pre-pandemic in 2019, there was about three and a half months worth of inventory sitting on the market. Today, we have about three weeks worth of inventory. Houses are moving very quickly here. So you have three, four, five days to get an offer in and get an offer accepted. While still less expensive than many cities, prices are going up. The average single family home price in Billings and the surrounding area was $376,248 in June, up almost 28% from a year earlier. And it seems new homes can't be built quickly enough to keep up with the demand. Almost all the homes in this subdivision, which range from $350,000 to $700,000, are already sold. We've got these barn doors here, which lead into the laundry room and mudroom. And this particular kitchen has quartz countertop over the island. The master bedroom's in its own wing of the house. Large room, nice high vaulted ceiling. With remote work freeing many people from their daily commute, families looking to stretch their dollar and their square footage are buying up the suburbs too. How do you even sum up what the market is like right now? Janae, it's crazy. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. So here's the second bedroom. Pat Davis has been selling real estate in the New Jersey suburbs of New York City for nearly 30 years. You've got skylights yeah, here. In the midst of the pandemic, are you getting a lot of families who had been in the city paying a whole lot of money for not a whole lot of space coming out here and they're helping fuel this market? Absolutely. We have a lot of young people coming in with children that are looking for these types of homes, starter homes, um, you know, three bedrooms, looking for it to entertain their families and have them come out. So welcome. You have a beautiful living room, yeah. hardwood flooring. What I love is the windows. So you have these large windows, let in a lot of the natural light, mm -hmm. wood burning fireplace. Davis just listed this house in Montclair, New Jersey for $639,000. The town of Montclair has become a magnet for families who want to live in the suburbs, but still have easy access to New York City. With its direct trains, highly rated schools, and quaint downtown areas, it is much of what home buyers are willing to pay top dollar for. We have yeah. a little breakfast nook. This is what everyone loves, white cabinets, mm -hmm. granite counters, stainless steel appliances. Yeah. So it works. It, absolutely, absolutely. What we're seeing is a lot of families with young children two and younger. Yeah. Um, so this is You're a great my language. starter home. <laughs> great starter home, but it could also be beyond, right? Yeah. So starter home plus. Formal dining room, and again, the beautiful accents. Pat says the house went into contract for more than the asking price after just 13 days on the market. We did weekend open houses, Saturday, Sunday. We had over 50 people come through. But not everyone can afford this. The boom has locked out many first time buyers across the country who are losing their dream homes to all cash above ask offers. We quickly became outbid and did not end up getting the house. We kept seeing houses on the market that would be gone within some of them literally 24 hours. It's really disheartening. It's really tough to compete in a market like this if you're a first time home buyer and you don't have the down payment money. If you're using one of the products that's available for people that are first time home buyers that don't have a lot of down yeah. payment money, they're just not able to compete in this marketplace. In Billings, Montana, the Elwoods had to pay over asking price to close the deal on their house. We ended up having to put, you know, about 30,000 more for uh, above the asking price. Um, and even with that, we were one of 10 offers that came in. But for Emily and Travis, their new life in Billings yeah, makes it all worth it. I'd do it 100 times over.
extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. The most powerful stories of our time Anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime. Cinematic. Real life drama. Stunning. The unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. I've worked most days every week I've been here. It's exhausting. There are no more beds in the rest of the hospital, so there's not really anywhere for patients to move. In short, it's definitely worse here than it was last time. Six months ago when we last talked, I really thought things were going in a different direction. Normal temperature. I did not for a second think I would be here again right now. Let me see your skills. My faith keeps me grounded. Go, go, go. My family keeps me grounded. Hi, how are you? Travel nurses are heroes. You rise to the occasion when it matters most, and that's what we are. That's what travel nurses are. That's what we do. Again, it's always, well, when will you be back? When should we expect you kind of thing? See you later. You can tell by, you know, how tight the hugs are. Love you. <clears throat> For traveling nurses, I don't get a chance to be with my family. I don't get a chance to hug my kids or to kiss my husband every day of the week. And so it's, it's a challenge and it's a sacrifice that not everybody is willing to make. It's just that I've been chosen to make it. My name is Decoya Billy. I am a travel nurse. I'm Bridget Harrigan. I'm 28 years old and I am a travel nurse. You miss out on family things, birthdays, and I've missed Christmas before. There are definitely sacrifices. New York's first case of coronavirus affected a 39-year-old healthcare worker who had World just health organization now declaring a global pandemic. I knew I had to go. There was no question about it. They 
assigned me to Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, New York. The epicenter of the epicenter. Doctors on the front lines warning hospitals are increasingly overwhelmed. My first assignment was here in New York. It was scary. You think about the lives lost and, you know, the families that were hurting. Um, you think about your own family. I have Jalen. I have Elijah. And then I have Carrington. He's the oldest of the twins. She wants to say hi. And then Kinsley is the youngest, and she's the only girl. I figured, okay, this is serious. It's not going anywhere. I still need to help provide for my family. The twins were about three months old. I was pumping because they were premature. My husband, he told me, as long as I have milk, <laughs> then I am good to go. When we explained it to the children, we just basically said that mom has a work assignment. She'll be gone for a little bit, but she'll be back. So it's got everything I really need. I was only supposed to be there for four weeks. And then I ended up extending because it was continuing to get worse. Not too bad, the mask marks today. I was about two weeks into my assignment. I started to feel badly. I have a fever now, 100.7. Definitely convinced that I have COVID because what else could it be? <coughs> oh, there we go. I got it. Rise and shine. Today is day 12 of 20 something. I had lost count and I'm tired. But you push on another day to help those in need. <laughs> Every time she returns home, I do find myself having a sigh of relief inside, knowing that she's safe. Getting to spend that quality time with my family uh, definitely makes it harder to leave. Six months ago when we last talked, I took an assignment in Guam, which was amazing. And I was there until the end of May came back home to Texas. And then the pandemic revved up again for the next surge, and now I'm in the Woodlands, Texas. It is insane here. What I've seen is that every single patient, aside from one that's come through the ICU in the last four to five weeks, has been unvaccinated. I'm actually kind of renewed in my sense of being a nurse. I'm feeling again what I used to always feel about being in the right place and doing the right thing. Sun's out, it's beautiful out, it's time to get ready. Uh, the CDC says that you're to isolate for 10 days. We see on average about 350 patients a day. Let's confirm your name and date of birth, please. Six months ago, um, patients were rushing in to get tested because of the unknown. Uh, now, patients are rushing in to get tested because it's a necessity. Babies were crawling. They're now full on running, climbing. Yay! Resilience is major for travel nurses. It's worth it. It's absolutely worth it to be a travel nurse. I've been absolutely amazed by the people I've met. All of these other nurses are my heroes. I don't believe that 
we could get through this at all without them. An extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by so people squeezing into the bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The star-studded event attracting some of the biggest celebrities and their unique outfits. Serena Williams saying her daughter approved of her bodysuit and feathered cape ensemble. Jennifer Hudson wowing onlookers with a stunning red dress. And Billie Eilish wearing an Oscar de la Renta dress she says was inspired by her favorite Barbie doll. Her teammates are taking the field with a game plan. We are strong together and we will fight until the end. We will fight uh, until every woman can play the sport that she wants to play, how she wants to play it. For the past year, Awa's team, the Hijabus, has been fighting to play in official matches without having to remove their hijabs. And while FIFA, soccer's world governing body, has allowed the Muslim veil on the pitch since 2014, the French Football Federation bans it. But a group of French women is working to change that, campaigning to open the beautiful game to all women, regardless of attire. No. Playing soccer as a team, it's a moment of union, of gathering together. But these women have to meet in small suburban soccer fields like this one. Awa is only 19 and sports is in her blood. We won the first place. We were very proud of us and uh, it was a great time. And she says playing soccer with her hair covered has also made her an activist. I think that we should express more ourselves. We should uh, raise our voice and tell what, uh, what we don't like, what we don't appreciate. Tell that it's our right to play with our hijab. 
In fact, all the way to the Olympics, female athletes are discarding dress codes. These women, including Awa and her teammates, using sports as a way to challenge patriarchal norms. Nowadays, women are visible. We are not like the kind of uh, hijabi they think we are, like the struggle in the house, who do uh, uh, housework, who, um, who, uh, who don't have a life, you know. And when they see a young woman wearing it, doing sports, educated, they don't want to say that. Because it's uh, in contradiction with uh, the vision that they have of the hijab. Through matches, sit-ins and social media, they try to publicize the practice of their sport freely. Yet France, citing safety concerns and secularism, are known in French as laïcité, is the only European country to ban religious signs on the field. In a statement, the French Football Federation saying it promotes and defends the values of secularism, living together, neutrality, and the fight against all forms of discrimination. They are banning the hijab because of uh, security and hygiene, uh, which is uh, which is the make nonsense. And it ended up uh, me choosing, having to choose between, you know, my passion and my faith. So um, it was a rough kind of part of my journey. Bilkis Abdul Qadir is an American basketball player who has experienced exclusion. When faced with a choice between her faith and sports, she put an end to her basketball career to advocate for those dreaming of careers in sports. In 2017, her efforts paid off when FIBA, the Federation of International Basketball, amended its rules to allow head coverings, citing that there were no safety concerns to players' health. Now Muslim women, not only Muslim women, but Jewish men who wear yarmulkes and sick men who wear turbans can all participate. And so this rule change was, was big for just the greater good. I lost my shot. However, I see the fruits of it now. Despite progress around the world, the veil is still at the heart of a national conversation in France, mainly because of what proponents call republican values. Laïcité, c'est le principe qui fait que l'État, depuis 1905, est reconnu comme neutre, c'est-à-dire que l'État ne reconnaît aucune religion. French Senator Agnès Canaillé argues that allowing religious signs and guards on the field could lead to radicalization. Nous, notre volonté euh, en, en France, c'est de fixer des limites suffisamment claires pour permettre l'exercice de ses convictions religieuses, de sa religion, dans la sphère privée, dans le cadre euh, des enceintes religieuses, des lieux cultuels euh, qui existent, qu'ils soient musulmans, euh, qu'ils soient euh, catholiques ou autres, mais euh, de faire en sorte de ne pas avoir la possibilité de laisser s'épanouir des idées euh, radicales qui se base sur la religion et qui prône l'atteinte aux institutions euh, et qui prône la fracture de la société française. This month, the French Parliament passing a new law on separatism, which critics say further stigmatizes Muslims. For Rim Sarah Alwan, a lawyer and a researcher on religious freedom, the laws restricting access to hijabis are rooted in racism. There was a time when the French had unveiling ceremony and you had a bunch of French women surrounding a Muslim woman wearing a headscarf, uh, celebrating the fact that she would remove her headscarf, usually by force, obviously, uh, and to say, now you're welcome in our society. Athletes are not the only ones banned from wearing religious garbs. French state workers and students also falling under the ban. But proponents of the ban say the laws don't go far enough in restricting religious expression. Non, nous pensons que ça n'interdit pas l'expression de la religion ni d'avoir des convictions religieuses, dès lors que ces convictions religieuses, elles restent dans la sphère privée. For our, it's a battle she fights every day. In the subway, I'm not feeling comfortable because uh, I saw people fixing me. Uh, they, they're like, what is she doing here? Awa and her team have yet to hear back from the French Football Federation. Until then, they'll keep fighting for equality on and off the field. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. 
It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back, let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing, people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run with Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Representatives from around the world, including in the U.S., are considering growing calls to boycott the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics over China's alleged human rights abuses, specifically allegations of rampant mistreatment and even genocide against the country's Muslim population in its northwest province. They're accused of forced labor and the detaining of millions of Muslims in re-education camps, forcing them to work in textile factories and more. Our Bob Woodruff has been covering this story for years and following several Muslim families as they move from country to country, seeking a place where they feel safe. His travels have taken him from Kazakhstan to Turkey and now here inside the U.S. Deep in Texas, more than 7,000 miles away from home, seven-year-old Bayan and her family are building a new life, a safer one. She and her mother, Gazira Alkan, start the day early. This is Bayan's second week at her Midland, Texas school. The friend from Kazakhstan is here too. Hi, how's your English? One, two, three. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, <laughs> high five. <laughs> When we last met them in the city of Almaty in Kazakhstan two years ago, they were all terrified. <laughs> 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 Gozira was telling us the story about how she was allegedly tortured by the Chinese and how Bayan was unable to see her for nearly two years when just outside in the hall, the local police stormed in. Police, police, police. Immediately, Gozira and Bayan fled the scene, and we were not far behind. Now we're kind of walking on the stairs quickly to get out. We really have no idea what she's lo what they're looking for. In the office right down the hall, we had also interviewed that friend, activist Sarek John Bilash, and a flood of families desperate for his help. They all lost contacts with fathers, mothers, or children, who they all claimed mysteriously disappeared in China. My mother. That's your mother. What happened to her? <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha, 
Balash was arrested not long after he left, ultimately allowed to avoid prison, he says, only if he agreed to stop representing Muslim Turkic families or anti-Chinese protesters in the future. He believes it was all because he was investigating these camps, often referred to by Chinese officials as vocational centers. This is where Balash believes the missing relatives of those desperate families we met were being held. Facilities like these are located throughout China's Xinjiang province, where Turkic Muslims make up the majority of the region. 7% are Kazakh, like Gulzira and Bayan. 46% are known as Uyghurs. Here, Turkic Muslims are allegedly being controlled, arrested, and tracked. Uh, that region, Xinjiang region, it's the most encapsulated area in the world in terms of information. Uyghurs need to install app on their phone so China can track. China can have access to what they're saying, what kind of picture and videos they're taking. While this area only accounts for 1.5 percent of China's populations, it accounts for about 21 percent of the country's arrests. And Turkic Muslims make up almost all of these arrests. It's considered suspicious. The app logs it. Authorities show up on your door and say, you've been praying too much, or why were you putting gas in somebody else's car? And if you know, they don't like your answers, you can be detained for that. After a rise in violence throughout Xinjiang in the last 20 years, Beijing blamed a radicalized group of Uyghurs for a series of attacks. And experts say that gave the government a scapegoat, turning this vibrant Muslim landscape into something of a police state. Locking up 10% of the region's population is not an appropriate response. The overwhelming majority of people who have been detained are not in any way alleged to have broken a discernible law. China is accused of committing a number of atrocities connected with their mistreatment of its Muslim population, and it's been described by some at the highest levels of the U.S. government with one word, genocide. My judgment uh, remains uh, that uh, genocide was committed against uh, against the Uyghurs, and uh, that uh, that hasn't changed. The claim that there is genocide in Xinjiang could not be more absurd, said Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. It is just a rumor fabricated with ulterior motives and a complete lie. China denies any mistreatment of its Muslim populations, claiming what we often see is part of anti-terrorism and de-radicalization efforts in Xinjiang in accordance with the law to protect people's lives. But because police cut short our interviews two years ago, we never really learned all the details of what might have happened to Gulzira, Bayan, and Bilash. Now that they are safe in Texas, they have a lot to say. Gulzira, tell me, what is it exactly that happened to you in China when you were put in one of those camps? All day and all night, I sit like a school student. Jira claims she was forced to learn Mandarin, forbidden to ever speak her native tongue. She says she and others were forced to take strange pills. We, we have heard that there is some forced sterilization in China, in these camps. Did you hear or see any of that? In prison, they let women to meet with men, and they were giving some drugs before meeting when approaching the door. They gave a white pill and checked the mouth by hands. I think it was a birth control pill. It is forbidden to be pregnant. The Chinese deny any form of forced sterilization in Xinjiang, but they do say that they have been promoting gender equality and birth control throughout the region, touting a lower Uyghur birth rate. A Chinese embassy tweet that Uyghur women were no longer baby-making machines was criticized online and removed from Twitter. But the statement citing one of their studies remains published in a newspaper owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Gozira was released, she says, after 15 months in the camps. But shortly after, she says she was arrested for communicating with her husband and Balash's organization. They showed our conversation with my husband on the computer. She says she was tortured. Her vivid account is similar to the accounts of other alleged camp survivors we interviewed in Kazakhstan back in 2019. There was this kind of tiger chair. Show me what that means. She tells us that government officials made her sit back as they chained her legs and hands 
then tying bricks to her hair, tightening the restraints so any movement would cause severe pain. Like many others, Golzira told us she was originally thrown in the camps for one simple reason. Because you went to Kazakhstan, you were imprisoned because you have a problem with your ideology. The Chinese deny her allegations and say she left the Kazakhstan to avoid paying back a loan, releasing a series of videos in an attempt to discredit Golzira and others with the similar claims, even calling them actors. Kazakhstan is one of the 26 nations China has listed as, quote, sensitive countries that could potentially breed terrorism. But many fleeing Xinjiang seek haven in these countries, like Gozira's family. For two years, you didn't see your mom? But Kazakhstan began to feel unsafe after Balash's arrest. He says two of his activist co-workers were attacked. In same time, in different cities, with un by unknown persons, it means it is too dangerous to all of my team members. It is too dangerous to all of former detainees. Out of fear, Gozira and Balash fled to Turkey, seeking refuge. The country is home to an estimated 50,000 Uyghurs, many from Xinjiang. Asia over there, Europe over there. We traveled to this boarding school just outside the city of Istanbul in western Turkey. Yani, yok. <laughs> <laughs> Filled with Uyghur children, some as young as Bayan, some older. Many of them telling us the same story about going from one country to the next, trying to escape China's grasp. Their parents now missing. The last time I spoke, I heard that my father was taken to the Chinese camp. Not just him, many relatives, my grandmother also. They are under repression. This boy has lost all contact with his family in Xinjiang. I think Turkey is walking a pretty fine line. Uh, you know, its economy clearly is not in great shape, and China has a lot to offer. This country was once considered a welcome haven for Turkic Muslims, but now... There's another spot where the Uyghurs are protesting. I asked the uh, Turkish government not to deport it back our people. Uyghurs here are increasingly concerned over China's growing foreign reach. She separated from the three sons uh, like six years ago, actually. Is everybody afraid of being sent back to China? I mean, yes, of course. At this protest outside China's consulate in Istanbul, the protesters were dragged away by police. Are Uyghurs being sent back into China by countries? Yes. Against their will? Yes. This government has really put pressure on you know, governments in Central Asia and Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, and even in, you know, parts of Europe to send people back. Abdusku Abul Basit says he was taken away by Turkish police in front of his young daughter, thrown in jail for the next 38 days. They said, we are the police. I said, OK, and opened the door. When they came in, they showed a document. Then they told me there was an investigation into me. My wife came out and I told her to call my dad if anything happened, and I left with the police. He told us the police came looking for a gun, but never found one. He believes he was branded a terrorist by the Chinese government, but with no proof, the Turkish police were forced to release him. With growing fears that China's influence could reach Balash and Gozira's family in Turkey, they fled once again, this time here, the United States perhaps one of the few real safe havens for this community. Bayan's family is applying for asylum so they could get permanent residence status with help from a nonprofit called China Aid. When you landed in the United States, what did it feel like? I felt happy when I arrived to America. I'm happy that I'm alive. I'm here abroad. 
There are so many Kazakh and Uyghur people suffering like me. In this country, Gulzira's daughter can celebrate her heritage with her family, a privilege <laughs> not afforded to others. Something she can do now without looking over her shoulder. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? I love you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Good job. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Please begin. This is the testimony of Elizabeth Holmes, the Stanford dropout who appeared poised to change the world, but didn't. Her fall from grace was spectacular. Elizabeth is finally going to trial. This case will probably go down in Silicon Valley history. But to this day, Elizabeth maintains her innocence. We'll take you inside the courtroom. If history is any indication, Elizabeth Holmes is not going going down without a fight. Follow the dropout Elizabeth Holmes on trial wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. The president of the United States is having an affair with an intern. Someone needs to go public. I promised him that I would not tell anyone. We just got to show him what really happened. Are you sure you have enough evidence? You are chaos. You are mayhem. These allegations are false. Mom, I'm in trouble. Impeachment American Crime Story, Tuesdays at 10, only on FX. Available now on demand. Let's talk about OnlyFans. The Instagram, but for porn. OnlyFans is massively a part of the pop culture zeitgeist right now. OnlyFans has definitely enabled us to call the shots. Anyone can come in from the ground floor and start making money. A lot of celebrities joining OnlyFans. Cardi B, Chris Brown. Bella Thorne. Within 24 hours, she made $1 million. You either love me or you hate me. Think of it as like an online playground. OnlyFans, selling sexy, exclusively on Hulu. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos. Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. To the international community, China has a message that its Xinjiang province is a wonderful land. But this video 
suggests a very different story. Human rights activists allege that slave labor is happening near facilities like these, where Uyghurs and others have been detained, located throughout Xinjiang, home to the majority of its Turkic Muslim community. The Chinese government claims these our vocational centers. We watched U.S. representatives call for a diplomatic boycott of China's 2022 Olympics over the issue. Uh, but we cannot proceed as if nothing is wrong about the Olympics going to China. There are actually factories that are effectively attached to the political education camps. And so part of the vocational training to which people are subjected involves working in these factories, some of which, or most of which are, are textile factories. China is making lots of money through Uyghur slave laborers. For years, the Chinese government has denied allegations of slave labor or that there are forced internment camps in the region. Many around the globe say it's part of a broader effort by the Chinese government to commit cultural genocide. In their final months, the Trump administration accused China of genocide. These are truly internment camps uh, where these people are being treated in ways that are fundamentally inconsistent with what China would have you believe. The Biden administration agrees. Uyghurs have been accusing China of genocide for years. China want to erase us from the map. We met Kazat Alte in 2019, a year after he says his father was taken to an internment facility in Xinjiang. He said, son, they're taking me. Like Kazat's father, Gozira Alkan says she was in one of those camps. And days after her release... You were forced to go to work in that factory. I wanted to go back home. But then they said, we'll send you back to re-education center. She managed to send a message to her husband in Kazakhstan. This picture of her outside the textile factory where she says she was forced to work. The next day they picked me and interviewed me at the factory and got me to the card. They showed our conversation with my husband from the computer. They said, you illegally revealed the factory to Kazakhstan. For her lack of silence, she says the government tortured her, sticking needles in her fingernails and beating her with a stick. I thought I had died that day. I felt my soul has passed. Gozira says she eventually escaped to Kazakhstan and made her way to the U.S. The Chinese deny her allegations and claim she left China to avoid paying back a loan. They even made this short documentary in an attempt to prove it. <laughs> ABC News was unable to contact any of the people featured in this production, but there was another video released on the same day. <laughs> I see my father there. He was on the band, and uh, he was publicly denouncing me on TV. Kazat is convinced his father and others were forced to make these videos. He started slowly contacting me through WeChat, and uh, he said, you know, they're asking you to stop. Can you stop what you're doing? I said, I, I can't. I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot stop. And uh, I started asking what happened to him in those concentration camp. Today, Kazat's father is again radio silent. They came to my father and said, if you talk to him again, we will take you to the camp again. While he waits, hopeful to hear from his father again, he continues his activism. Here in the U.S., paying for it like a, like a brand and promoting it. Uh, it is a shame on those companies. 85% of the cotton that is manufactured in China comes from the Xinjiang region. With numbers like that, it's difficult for Americans to avoid these products, with corporations stuck between ethical obligations and an economic reality. Um, it's really a moment of reckoning in that uh, they find themselves at the same time under enormous pressure, increasingly from, you know, not just advocates like Human Rights Watch, but from consumers not to use cotton or other products that may have been made by forced labor. But they're under enormous pressure from Chinese authorities not to talk about those issues publicly. U.S. Customs and Border Protection enacted a policy in January detaining all cotton products coming in from Xinjiang unless the importer can prove their product was not made with forced labor. 
Newark is one of the country's largest ports of entry, one of the locations where shipments that run afoul of U.S. Customs and Border Protection get sent. So these containers that came over from Xinjiang, they're now stored further away from here? Yeah, these, those containers, uh, because we wanted to take a look at the cargo, CBP gave us an exclusive look at how they detain and screen these incoming cotton goods from Xinjiang, China. Do you how many of these these shirts and how many these products? Have uh, uh, there are seized? a thousand cartons today in this container okay. of wearing apparel, um, but over the course of a fiscal year, you know, it could be up to half a million of them. So I guess it was their dream that these uh, these would end up on the clothes of some Americans with a lot of money. Consumer would have gone in and bought it, never knowing that the new shirt that they were putting on their back was the result of slave labor over in China. Whoever was importing these items has 90 days to claim them and cooperate with CBP's investigation. If they don't, the items are either sent back or destroyed. Like this, ah, so it's, it's, it's more and more are coming? More and more are coming. Huh. Uh, this order only went into effect two weeks ago. I've already got eight and five more coming in this week. Wow. As of today, whoever was importing these goods has not claimed them or attempted to prove they were not made with forced labor. At this point, CBP will, will take its next steps, could be a seizure, and eventually the goods would be destroyed. The Chinese government calls these allegations of forced labor an outrageous lie. So-called genocide, forced labor, systematic rape and torture in Xinjiang are lies of the century, which never happens and will never happen in China. I could tell more truths but you don't give me more time because you reject the truth. The Chinese embassy here in the U.S. has ignored requests for interviews with ABC News. Instead, they sent us a link to a statement published online. In it, they said some Uyghurs were part of cotton-picking forces. They worked together, cared for each other, and forged a deep friendship. These cotton pickers in and out of Xinjiang were all voluntary. Bob Woodruff, ABC News. Good evening. It appears uh, we are enjoying an overwhelmingly uh, no vote tonight here in the state of California. Uh, but no is not the only thing that was expressed tonight. Uh, I want to focus on what we said yes to as a state. We said yes to science. We said yes to vaccines. We said yes to ending this pandemic. We said yes to people's right to vote without fear of fake fraud or voter suppression. We said yes to women's fundamental constitutional right to decide for herself what she does with her body, and her fate and future. We said yes to diversity. We said yes to inclusion. We said yes to pluralism. We said yes to all those things that we hold dear as Californians and I would argue as Americans, economic justice, social justice, racial justice, environmental justice, our values where California has made so much progress. All of those things were on the ballot this evening. And so I'm humbled and grateful to the millions and millions of Californians that exercised their fundamental right to vote and express themselves so overwhelmingly by rejecting the division, by rejecting the cynicism, by rejecting so much of the negativity that's defined our politics in this country over the course of so many years. I just think of our kids watching all of this, nightly news, day in and day out. And I just wonder, you know, I've got four young kids, oldest about to turn 12 this weekend, and what they're growing up to. In a, in a world where we're so divided, these kids increasingly fearful, isolated, disconnected, and we're teaching them that. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think we owe our kids a deeper sense of respect and all of us as adults a responsibility to, to, to disregard this false separateness. We're so much more in common as a state and a nation that we give ourselves credit for. I've been all over the state of California 
over the last many years, but notably the last nine months. Conservative parts of the state, progressive parts of the state, folks that I, I know were going to vote no, and votes that I knew were going to vote yes on this recall and, and turned out to do just that. But one thing that's universal, everybody wants to be respected. Everyone wants to feel some connection to one another. We all certainly in this pandemic want to feel safe, protected. And those are universal values. And I think about just in the last you know, few days and the former president put out saying this election was rigged. Now, democracy is not a football. You don't throw it around. It's more like a, I don't know, antique vase. You can drop it and smash it in a million different pieces. And, and that's what we're capable of doing if we don't stand up to meet the moment and push back. I, I said this many, many times on the campaign trail. You know, we may have defeated Trump, but Trumpism is not dead in this country. The big lie. January 6th insurrection, all the voting suppression efforts that are happening all across this country, what's happening, the assault on fundamental rights, constitutionally protected rights of women and girls. It's a remarkable moment in our nation's history. But I'm reminded of uh, something, I don't know, a few decades ago someone told me when describing a difficult and challenging moment, said, the world is too small. Our time is too short and our wisdom is too limited to win fleeting victories at other people's expenses. And he went on to say, we must all triumph together. So in that spirit of recognizing and reconciling this moment and trying to understand what's going on, not just here in the state, but all across the United States of America, I just want to say this tonight, I'm humbled grateful, but resolved in the spirit of my political hero, Robert Kennedy, to make more gentle the life of this world. Thank you all very much, and thank you to 40 million Americans, 40 million Californians, and thank you for rejecting this recall. Good night, everybody. One of my favorite things to do, always get to the arenas early before they let anybody in. And you can just dribble the ball, close your eyes, you can hear the echo of the bounce, the light, the rim, the net. I want to be the best player that I can become, and I will do anything to accomplish that. This man was probably the fiercest competitor the game has ever seen. You know, basketball for me was the most important thing. He did not want to lose. Kobe worked his tail off day and night. I have to make some sacrifices. This is what I want to do. He became the Black Mamba. He became legendary Kobe Bryant. If it's going to make me better than Michael Jordan, I'm doing it. This kid has passion like you would never know. We have this breaking news to bring you out of California. Some folks were out here mountain biking this morning and saw an aircraft in distress that went down into the hillside. We now have information about at least one of those passengers who has died in that helicopter crash. Kobe Bryant's 13-year-old daughter he was also on the helicopter that crashed. We all was kind of raised with Kobe. We watched him grow. He touched everyone worldwide. He'll be loved and he'll be in my heart forever. Kobe Bryant in Los Angeles transcended his sport. He was of this city. 
Kobe Bryant had the best story because he told it himself. I want to be the best player that I can become, and I would do anything to accomplish that. And I understand that it's all in my hands. When you look at his origin story, everything goes back to Kobe Bryant grew up for most of his childhood in Italy because his father was playing overseas there. My father played professional basketball. He played for the Philadelphia 76ers. He used the Rockets and San Diego Clippers. Kobe Bryant's dad, Joe Jellybean Bryant, was a legend in the city of Philadelphia. He was six foot 10. He could do things with the ball in the 70s that really nobody could do. And he ends up playing in Italy for the second half of his career. At the time, I was only six years old. And I was pretty much clueless about the whole situation. But my parents basically told me, Kobe, you're going to an Italian school. We want you to learn a new language. When you're young, you just basically do whatever your parents tell you to do, with no questions asked. I met the very young Kobe Bryant. It had to be 1989. I was playing overseas in Italy, and I was actually playing against his father. He was 10 or 11 years old. I was just this little eager, industrious kid on the sideline that was challenging everybody to play one-on-one -on -one and play horse. He grew fascinated with the NBA through tapes that his grandparents would mail him. Kobe grows up idolizing Michael Jordan. Everyone wants to be like Mike, and nobody wanted to be like Mike more than Kobe Bryant. He wanted to be seen as being that great. And I used to go on the court and try to emulate all the moves and kind of imagine myself playing against other guys. There weren't anybody out there that was going to come to the court and play with me. So who'd you play with? I played by myself. You did shadow basketball? Shadow basketball. Yeah. First of all, I really want to thank my brilliant campaign staff. My, my campaign manager, Jeff Corliss, my co-chair, Tony Strickland, my campaign chairman, Lionel Chetwin. Lionel, come up here, give me some love. Give me some love, Lionel. And his significant other, Superglow Gloria. My Director Jennifer Alazieri. Took me a while to learn how to pronounce that, but I finally developed it. I hope I don't leave anybody out. The rest of my campaign stand. Deanne Tate, where's Deanne? I never have quite understood what Deanne did every time I say so, but she just does a little bit of everything. But I want to thank the volunteers who knocked on doors, who called people, who emailed people over 100,000 people who contributed to our campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Agnes, how are you? I love you more. Don't tell my girlfriend. She's kind of territorial. Mark, how are you? Mark, you were there from day one. God bless you. Where's Betty Chu? Is Betty around? Betty, Betty, what, what is she? What is she? I, I hate, my mom used to tell me, never mention a woman's age. What are you, 82 years old, 84? First uh, Asian American to pass the bar of California, become a lawyer. You know, our campaign was all, Michael, Michael Horn, how are you? God bless you, I love you more. Yes. We all love you, Larry. Oh. Nashrin, how are you? Nashrin, how are you? This campaign, where's Gloria? Where's Gloria Romero? I don't see Gloria Romero anywhere. There she is, Gloria Romero. Gloria, let me say something about Gloria Romero. You know who Gloria Romero is. Gloria Romero is a Democrat. I'm hoping a recovering Democrat, but we'll see. She was the Senate Majority Leader. She crossed party lines. She's still a Democrat. Like my mother was still a Democrat. My brother was still a Democrat. I couldn't get them to change their party, but I got them to vote a lot more sensibly. 
glory across state party lines in supporting my candidacy because of the issue of school choice. Because of the issue of school choice. As you know, my opponent, Governor Gavin Newsom, come on, let's, let's, let's be gracious, let's be gracious in defeat. And by the way, we may have lost the, the battle, but we are going to win the war. Gloria cross party lines because of the issue of school choice. We're spending $15,000 every year for students in our government schools in California. Notice I don't call them public schools, I call them government schools. $15,000 a year, some of the worst reading, reading scores, some of the worst, worst math scores, only about 15 or 16 states spend more. And the students that are getting the raw end of the deal are the black and brown students who comprise 80% of the government students in our government schools. They're getting the worst teachers, the worst principals, the worst administrators, the worst outcomes. What is the route from poverty to middle class at least finish high school? One presumably where you can read, write, and compute at grade level, and that is not happening. I read a study that said roughly 5% of government teachers across the nation are incompetent. Roughly 5%. I have no idea whether that's true of California, but let's assume for a moment that it is. There are 300,000 public school teachers in California. Any given year, 2.2 are fired. If it is true that 5% are incompetent, that means 15,000 are incompetent, 2.2 every year are fired. Again, I'm not saying that applies to California, but assuming it does, imagine if that applied to cops in LA. I'm in LA, 10,000 force, assuming 15% were incompetent. We're talking about 500, 500. Doing what? Planning evidence? Engaging in racial profiling? Using excessive force? We wouldn't put up with it. We would put up with 15,000 incompetent public school teachers. That is why Gloria and I support school choice. So the money... So the money goes into an account, education savings account, that the parent can control, put the kid in a charter school, a private school, a religious school, or God forbid, homeschooling. The reason we started this campaign is because this man, Governor Gavin Newsom, was sitting up there at the French Laundry restaurant with lobbyists who contributed to his campaign, with the people who drafted the mandates that they were violating by not wearing masks, by not engaging in social distancing, while telling you to do it. Meanwhile, his own kids were enjoying in-person private education. Now, he incurred a $12,000 wine tab. No, I don't know what they ordered, but I bet you it wasn't Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> Crime up. Crime up. 41% in LA, and I'm talking about shootings, homicides. Under this governor, 20,000 convicted felons were released early. What could possibly go wrong? The other day, former, president, former Senator Barbara Boxer was mugged in Oakland. You're not cheering for Barbara Boxer being mugged, are you? This is a, this is a rough crowd. It's a rough crowd. Also, I wanted to give some love to Arnie Steinberg. Arnie Steinberg, my strategist. Arnie, you were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Also, Jenny Sand is here. Jenny. Without you, I probably wouldn't have run. Jenny Sand, Pastor Jack Hibbs. Dennis, Dennis Prager. And again, my chairman, Lionel Chatwin, all of whom advised me to run. But ultimately, I decided to run because I felt that I could do something about the crime. I could do something about the homelessness. I could do something about the fact that 
California has now hit $800,000 average price of a home. That's 150% above the national average. Outrageous because of the stranglehold the environmental extremists have had over Gavin Newsom and have had over Sacramento. Love you more. We have five seasons in California now. The fifth one is fire because of the poor forest management. Outgoing Governor Jerry Brown had a plan to clear 500,000 acres of fallen trees, dead trees, and dry vegetation. And our governor claimed that he cleared 90,000 acres, which would have been a drop in the bucket if it were true, but it wasn't. According to the LA Times, he only cleared 13% of what he said he would, which meant he exaggerated by a factor of seven. You know, before the pandemic, before the pandemic, half of all third graders in our government schools could not read at state levels of proficiency. Half. And those levels are low. Math scores even worse. 75% of black boys could not read at state levels of proficiency. Math scores are even worse. Because I care about this, I've been called the black face of white supremacy. We're running out of water in California. We haven't added to our water infrastructure in 40 or 50 years when the state was half its size. It's not like voters don't know what to do. We pass bond measure after bond measure after bond measure for more reservoirs, to raise dams, for more underground water storage, and yet the water drains right out into the Pacific Ocean. There is a desert nation in the Middle East. It's called Israel. Because of desalination, because of desalination, they are now water self-sufficient. They got a little body of water next to them called the Mediterranean. We have a little body of water next to us called the Pacific Ocean. We can't figure this out? <laughs> Rolling brownouts? Are you kidding me? Rolling brownouts. Because we're forcing our utility companies to invest tens of millions of dollars into weather-dependent, unreliable sources of energy called wind and solar. A war on oil and gas. It almost takes an act of Congress to get a permit to drill an oil well or to drill for natural gas. Many of the middle class jobs, working class jobs related to those industries are all now gone. For the first time in our state's history, never happened before, what are we, 170 years old? I think, Arnie, you were there when it first happened, right? <laughs> first time in our state's history, people are leaving. A net migration out of California, I love the smile, sir. Net migration out of California. And when middle class people cite as the reason for leaving, the number one reason they cite is they cannot afford the price of a home. Average price has just hit $800,000, which is 150% above the national average, largely because of the environmental extremists that allow people to file a lawsuit to stop any development project for any reason for an indefinite period of time. It is outrageous. And businesses are leaving. More businesses have left California this year. You left too? You're, you're leaving soon? You're leaving soon? Yeah. More businesses have left California so far this year than have left all of last year, and the rate at which people are leaving California is nearly twice the rate that they've left the last two or three years. There's a magazine called CEO Magazine. You know I've mentioned that magazine. It's been around for 17 years. 17 years. They've asked CEOs, which is the worst state in which to do business, based upon taxes, based upon spending, based upon the power of the public sector unions, based upon whether or not the state has a pro-business or an anti-business attitude. For 17 consecutive years, California has been determined to be the worst state in which to do business. Now, nobody cares about millionaires and billionaires, to quote Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Highest state income tax in the nation, 13.3%. There are 40 million people living in California. 1% pay half of the state income taxes, and the state income taxes are the largest source of revenue. 1% account for half of all the state income taxes. So when a millionaire or billionaire leaves California, he or she is taking that massive tax base with them, leaving less money for the things government is supposed to do. This is what we're facing. 
rising crime, declining quality of our public schools, shut down the state to the point where a third of all small businesses are now gone forever. We've only recovered half of our jobs pre-pandemic as opposed to two-thirds of the rest of the nation because we're paying people not to work. Rolling brownouts, water shortages. Farmers in Kern County tell me now they are rationing water. I can't think of anything that this man has done in the last two years that success he deserves another day in office. However, we recognize that we lost the battle, but we are certainly going to win the war. We're forcing... We are forcing them now to pay attention to the problem of homelessness. We are forcing them now to do a better job on schools. We are forcing them now to do a better job on clearing our forests. We're forcing them now to do a better job about energy. We are forcing them now to pay attention to the things they should have paid attention to two years ago. So. I know that I want to say a little something about my mom and my dad because they're looking at me right now. You know, my dad came here in 1945, didn't have two nickels to rub together, eighth grade dropout who did not know who his biological father is, clean toilets full-time, two jobs, one for Nabisco brand bread and one for Barbara Ann bread. Saved up enough nickels and dimes to start a little cafe in an area of L.A. called Pico Union. Bought a house uptown in South Central that is now worth $700,000. I only mention that because it's still in our family, wonderful for us, but somebody who had an eighth grade dropout education, who worked three or four jobs, could not have a stay-at-home wife, as my dad did, educating three boys until the last of us went to middle school, could not duplicate that path because of the outrageous cost of living in California, largely driven by these environmental extremists that have had a stranglehold over Gavin Newsom and have had a stranglehold over Sacramento. We're going to turn that around. They're going to have to pay attention to that now. They weren't going to before, but now because of us, because of you, they're going to have to pay attention to that. So we... So we have lost a battle, but we are absolutely going to win the war. Absolutely. My mother... My mother would not have put up with this di racial division that we're having right now. Critical race theory, reparations, dividing us by race. Notice that all these people, whether it were Barack Obama or Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, all of whom cut a commercial for Gavin Newsom, notice they never said the following words. Gavin Newsom has a, done a good job for the people of California. It's a Republican takeover. White supremacists, say hello to the black face of white supremacy. Hey, don't laugh. Don't laugh. I worked hard for that title. What do you think would have happened if a candidate such as Barack Obama running for president had a white woman in a gorilla mask throw an egg at him? What would have happened? Front page news, Washington Post. Front page news, New York Times. Systemic racism, alive and well in America. They would have been talking about it in Bangladesh. But with me, nothing. Now, now let's analyze this. Maybe the lady who threw the egg was one of the 20,000 convicted felons that Gavin Neesom released early. I don't know. Maybe she would have been in jail had we not had a soft on crime DA who was backed by Gavin Newsom who believes in cashless bail. Maybe she would have been in jail. Now, I was called sexist, so I want to be very careful about this. People have told me that this white woman had a gorilla mask. And I've said to my friends, how do you know it was a mask? I don't know. You know, 
And I have never, I have never suggested that anybody should vote for me because I'm black or against me because I'm black. I don't go there. As far as I'm concerned, after we elected the first black president, everything else after that is anticlimactic. Okay? Okay? But, but, front page article in the New York Times. It was negative. All about me, never once mentioning my race, that I'm black, never once mentioning that if I were to win, I'd be the first black governor of California. Now, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. But on the same page, equally long article about, quote, the first female governor of New York. Now, she had a D at the end of her name, so it's relevant she's the first. I have an R at the end of my name, and suddenly I'm no longer black. It's amazing how that happens. Astonishing how that happens. How astonishing how that happens. They try to divide us on race. They want black people not to think about the fact that families have been destroyed because of the welfare state. They don't want black people to think about the decline of the quality of public education. They don't want black people to think about jobs. All they want is black people to think about oppression. That you are under siege. You are a victim. Really? In 2021, after we elected the first black president who got a higher percentage of the white vote than John Kerry did four years earlier? Knock it off! Knock it off! Knock it off. It divides us by race. We believe in the dream of MLK, dividing, judging people by content of character, not color of skin. And let me tell you something. To the extent that it is humanly possible, America has achieved that dream. Come on. Larry, the headline is going to be, I'll speak slowly because I know CNN is here. Headline, headline. <laughs> come on, Head, headline's gonna be, headline's gonna be, Larry Elder says there's no racism in America. No, I didn't say that. Hell, 8% of Americans believe Elvis is still alive. I don't know what to tell you. But to the extent that it is humanly possible, we have achieved the dream of Martin Luther King where people are being evaluated by content of character and not color of skin. Knock it off. Obama was running in 2007. He was running against Hillary for the nomination. Mitt Romney was running against John McCain for Republican nomination, right? Gallup decided to ask which of these four candidates had the biggest hurdle. They asked Americans, what percentage of you would never vote for a black person for president? 5%. 2007. What percentage would never vote for a female president? 11%. What percentage would never vote for a Mormon, referring to Mitt Romney? 24%. What percentage would never vote for somebody who would be 72 years old when he became president, referring to John McCain? 42%. So Obama had a lower hurdle than these three white politicians. Knock it off. Knock it off. Speaking of the former president, when he was running for the nomination against Hillary, he hadn't caught her yet. He was invited on 60 Minutes. And Steve Croft, the correspondent, said, Senator, if you don't get the nomination, will it be because of your race? And I'm at home by myself. Nina wasn't there. And I said, let me see what this man says. And he said, no. If I don't get the nomination, it will be because I have not articulated a vision that the American people can embrace. I said, hallelujah. He's not what I call a victocrat. He's not Sharpton. He's not Jesse Jackson. He's not dividing us. Fast forward. He gets in. And by the way, when he walked into office, he had 70% approval, which meant a whole bunch of people who didn't vote for him because he got about 52% said, okay, all right. You know, I, I don't agree with taxing and spending and regulations and soft on the borders and soft on national security, but at least he will be a racial reconciliator. What did he do? He divided us time and time and time again. The Cambridge police acted stupidly. Remember that? 
his good friend Skip Gates, who's a professor at, uh, at Harvard of African American Studies, uh, comes back from vacation, forgets his door key, he and the cab driver break into his house. Neighbor sees this, doesn't recognize him, Cambridge, and calls 911. Don't you want your neighbors to do that? White cop shows up, very politely says, sees him in the house, doesn't know if he belongs to the house. Says, sir, please come out and show ID. What did Gates say? I'll come out if your mama tells me to come out. You know what? And what Obama should have said, what Obama should have said, this is early in his presidency, when he should have set the table, Obama should have said, you know, last night I talked to my friend Skip Gates, I've known him for a number of years, I said, Skip, 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 come on, come on. You're a Harvard professor, you're tenured. A lot of these profile killings, high profile killings, shootings would have been avoided if the suspect slash civilian had just complied. So I told him, I said, knock it off, knock it off. You should have just come out and said, show some ID. Incident would have been over, but you copped an attitude. Obama didn't say that. What did he say? The Cambridge police acted stupidly. No, they didn't. They did their job. If I had a son who looked like Trayvon, what does that mean? There's a place called Ferguson where we have our own problems. It was a lie. Michael Brown did not have his hands up, did not say don't shoot. It was a lie. He invited Al Sharpton, the nation's most notorious race card hustler, into the White House over 70 times. He embraced this bogus Black Lives Matter movement. He made things worse. I'm a uniter. We are uniting. We are going to bring this country together. We are going to bring this country together. Because we know what the real problems are, and they have nothing whatever to do with racism. I was talking to a black reporter about all of this. He says, uh, you don't believe in systemic racism? I said, no, I don't. I said, study after study after study has shown that if cops, if anything, they are more hesitant, more reluctant to pull the trigger on a black suspect than a white suspect. In fact, more unarmed whites are killed every year than unarmed blacks. I said, name one unarmed white. He couldn't do it. Because CNN doesn't care. MSNB Hee doesn't care. Anderson Cooper doesn't care. They only care if an unarmed black person is killed. More unarmed whites killed every year than unarmed blacks. It is a lie, I said to him. He still wasn't feeling me. You know, I'm a Uncle Tom, I'm a sellout, I'm a bootlicker, I'm the black face of white supremacy. I said, by far, the biggest problem in our society in general, the biggest problem in the black community in particular, is a large number of children who enter the world without a father married to the mother. Let's be real here. Let's be real. He didn't want to hear it. I said, all right, let's do this. Get out your magic wand. Stephen Sachs, much love, Zana. Get out your magic wand. Stephen Sachs, I've known him for a number of years from South Africa. He can tell you what apartheid is really like. Um, we're in apartheid state America. I mean, really? So I said, get out your magic wand. Wave it over America. Remove every smidgen of racism from the hearts of white people. Now, everybody in America who's white thinks like Mother Teresa, I said to him. Do we still have the phenomenon where 70% of black children enter the world without a father married to the mother? Forget about elder. I love to quote left-wing people whenever I can. Barack Obama once said, only said it once, he got hammered, doesn't say it anymore. A kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in jail. Now, 25% of black children into the world without a father married to the mother in 1965. Now the number is 70%. I said, do we still have that phenomenon? By the way, 25% of white kids now enter the world today without a father married to the mother. Half of all Hispanic kids enter the world without a father married to the mother. 40% of all children do because, because when Lyndon Johnson launched the so-called war on poverty, $20 trillion later, we are incentivizing women to marry the government and incentivizing men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. And I said to him, after you wave this wand, do we still have the situation where the number one cause of preventable death for young white men is accidents, like car accidents or drownings? 
whereas the number one cause of preventable death for young black men is homicide, almost always at the hands of another young black man. Do we still have the phenomenon, I told him, where of the 15,000 annual homicides every year, half of the victims are black, even though blacks are only 13% of the population? Do we still have that phenomenon? Do we still have the phenomenon where a young black man is eight times more likely to be killed than a young white man? I said, if the answer to that series of questions is true, then I submit to you that systemic racism is not the problem and critical race theory and reparations are not the answer. <laughs> Knock it off. Knock it off. We, our movement is about bringing people together and dealing with the problems that we have of crime, of homelessness, of people leaving this state because of the high cost of living, because we have the highest state income tax in the nation, because we have high regulations, because we're not managing our forest properly, because we're not managing our, intergrid, our energy grid properly, and we are not investing in our water infrastructure. These are the kinds of things that we're going to deal with. It's not about race. Knock it off. My father came here in 1945, two nickels to rub together, worked two full-time jobs cleaning toilets, started a little cafe, Pico Union area, became a Marine, World War II Marine. Thank you, sir. By the way, when I asked my dad why he became a Marine, he said two reasons. You know what I'm going to say. They go where the action is, and I love the uniforms. And my father always told my brothers and me, hard work wins. You get, you get out of life what you put into it. You cannot control the outcome, Larry, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you complain about what somebody said to you or did to you, go to the nearest mirror, look at it, and say, what could I have done to change the outcome? And finally, my father always told this to my brothers and me, no matter how hard you work, how good you are, sooner or later, bad things are going to happen. How you deal with those bad things will tell your mother and me if we raised a man. And every day, I try to please my mother and my father by trying to convince them that they, in fact, have raised a man. So. I just want to thank everybody, all my volunteers, all the people who knocked on doors, who rang doorbells, who made phone calls, who went online. I want to thank my wonderful campaign staff. I have been a politician for all of seven or eight weeks. How am I doing? They are now listening in ways they never listened before. They're now hearing us in ways they never heard us before. They're now going to work our problems the way they've never done before. I'm not somebody like my opponent who was born on third base and thought he hit a triple. I'm somebody from the inner city whose parents came here, as I said, with nothing, who worked hard, love you too, who worked hard who believed in the American dream. And we believe in the American dream. We believe in a country. We believe in the vision of Martin Luther King. We believe in hope, true hope, true unity. We don't divide by race. We don't divide by gender. We don't divide by sexual orientation. We don't divide by ethnicity. We don't divide by religion. We unite. My opponent referred to this recall as a move to take over California by white supremacists. Do I look like a white supremacist? Now, when you consider, we don't blame, we don't finger point, we don't roll like that. But when you consider, we were outspent by a factor of five, six, seven to one. I wasn't running just against Gavin Newsom. I was running against the left-wing media. I was, running, I was running against a newspaper, the LA Times, that referred to me as the black face of white supremacy. I was for, refer, I'm running against a newspaper that called me everything but a black David Duke. I'm running against a media that serves as a public relations bureau for the left. 
and we still scared the bejesus out of them. That's why they brought in, uh, they brought in, brought in Barack Obama. They brought in Bernie Sanders, a socialist who owns three homes. But I digress. They brought in Senator Warren, and as I said before, all they did, all they did was call this a Republican takeover. I mentioned State Senator Gloria Romero. Sixty-three percent of Hispanics voted for this man just two years earlier. And Gloria, you know this: the majority of Hispanics now want him out over the issue of school choice. The majority of declined estate voted for him just two years ago. Now the majority want him out. And they're calling this a Republican takeover. It is insulting to the people of California who signed that petition and who voted yes on the recall. It is insulting. But that's how they roll. We don't roll that way. We don't finger point, we don't blame, we roll up our seas, we get back to it because as I said before, we may have lost the battle, but we're sure as hell gonna win the war. <laughs> Finally, let me leave you with this. I wanna thank all of the religious leaders who back me. Pastor, Pastor Joe Pettick of Huntington Hills, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Chino. Pastor Joe Franklin, Fresno, Pastor Paul Chapel, Lancaster, hope I'm not leaving anybody out. You all got my love, and I love you so much. And I must tell you, I have been overwhelmed by the support. Men, men, women coming up to me, crying, saying that for the first time, you've now given me hope that things can turn around. Now, tomorrow I'm going to be asked by all the members of the media, what are you going to do next? What happens after this? Christian, thank you for your love. What happens after all of this? As a former radio host, let me just say this. Stay tuned. God bless you. May God bless California. we got a state to say. Pay attention. You just may learn something. now and america this morning the best new video the breaking news overnight emergency crews called to the town of surfside u.s airstrikes hitting targets in iraq and syria the stories people are talking about you don't want to shave your legs don't I was gonna say, oh my got it. and what to expect in the day ahead abc world news now and america this morning starting at 2 a.m eastern up all night to keep you up to date it was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Please begin. This is the testimony of Elizabeth Holmes. The Stanford dropout who appeared poised to change the world, but didn't. Her fall from grace was spectacular. Elizabeth is finally going to trial. This case will probably go down in Silicon Valley history. But to this day, Elizabeth maintains her innocence. We'll take you inside the courtroom. If history is any indication, Elizabeth Holmes is not going down without a fight. Follow the dropout Elizabeth Holmes on trial wherever you get your podcasts.
most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Even the best of us get scared. Something kind of magical happened when I stepped up to the podium. So much has changed in the blink of an eye. I have felt as if I've been shot out of a cannon. Rolling. She rocked the inauguration and inspired millions across the country and the world. Now finally, for the first time, the Amanda Gorman you don't know. And how does Amanda answer this? I wouldn't be here where I am today if I hadn't been so... Brave Enough, Amanda Gorman, the all-new Robin Roberts exclusive event, Wednesday night at 10, 9 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Gianna Bryant brought out something so incredible in Kobe Bryant. His daughter had the same love for basketball, even as a young girl, that he used to. And as her love grew for the sport, she sort of brought him back to the game. When we got to shoot my podcast with Kobe, he was excited about it. When I took it to the Laker game, that's the first Laker game I've been to since like, Jersey retirement. We just had so much fun because for the first time I was seeing the game through her eyes. Like she was having such a good time. I think he thoroughly enjoyed that so much to the point where he started coaching. I started teaching her piece by piece, and she started enjoying it and loved it and loved it, and now she plays every day. And so it's been a, a joy to watch her grow. He was probably the happiest dad on earth. I mean, what's better than your daughter wanting to play basketball after you've played for your whole life? Gigi was Kobe. She talked like Kobe. She was fearless, just like Kobe. She was ready to, to bring it on. She's intense and really competitive. Are you surprised? No, she gets it from her mama. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Now with the basketball team that we have, we practice every single day. So start out two sets. He was just talking about, you know, his second act and how he was building this basketball universe with the Mama Academy. You lay back and you kind of let them find their own way a lot. When they started playing, they were pretty bad. They were a good team. Patience, patience, man. They're 12. You just got to be patient, let them develop, let them grow. And, and Kobe was, was like, if I'm going to coach you, we're not going to be bad. We're just going to keep on getting better, and there's really no other option. And I think that's the most important thing to understand is that there's no difference between a young girl playing basketball and a young boy playing basketball. They can be just as great, if not greater. He starts coaching, and then he broadens it. And he starts extending it to WNBA players. Starts shining a light on women's basketball. Having him at the WNBA game, and especially there alongside with Gigi, he made the WNBA cool for the guys. He was just a, a loving dad, man. But just seeing him and, 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 and Gianna, it was very special. They just had a very special relationship. Those two, when I when I saw them, and gosh, man, they was they was inseparable. It was January 26, 2020. Gianna had a basketball tournament, so did some of her other friends. So Kobe Bryant and Gianna and, and some of the parents and those kids jumped on a helicopter and were flying to this basketball tournament. To echo X-ray, advise it to be a fog condition. Uh, and then the, the fog was, I've never seen it so thick in my life. To echo X-ray, you're uh, still too low level uh, for uh, flight following at this time. Because they were following the freeway. It's always foggy there. The south of 101 helicopter went down. I was one of the first people on scene. The people I talked to said the helicopter was getting louder and louder, and then it seemed like it fell from the sky. Breaking news to bring you out of California. They would not say who was on board. L.A. fire authorities, first responders all there trying to determine what happened. Finally, there comes confirmation from another outlet. Kobe is... <clears throat> Hey, Kobe's died in this helicopter crash. And... Uh, 
I just sank. I'm sitting in my desk chair at home, and I just, I just, I just lost it. It has been confirmed that NBA star Kobe Bryant was on board that helicopter. And then it keeps getting worse. It's not just Kobe. There were no survivors. We have a manifest that indicates that there was nine people on board the aircraft. The pilot plus eight individuals. It's, it's all these other people, including a bunch of kids <clears throat> and including his daughter, Gigi. an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Please begin. This is the testimony of Elizabeth Holmes, the Stanford dropout who appeared poised to change the world but didn't. Her fall from grace was spectacular. Elizabeth is finally going to trial. This case will probably go down in Silicon Valley history. But to this day, Elizabeth maintains her innocence. We'll take you inside the courtroom. If history is any indication, Elizabeth Holmes is not going down without a fight. Follow the dropout Elizabeth Holmes on trial wherever you get your podcasts. The president of the United States is having an affair with an intern. Someone needs to go public. I promised him that I would not tell anyone. We just gotta show them what really happened. Are you sure you have enough evidence? You are chaos. You are mayhem. These allegations are false. Mom, I'm in trouble. Impeachment American Crime Story, Tuesdays at 10, only on FX. Available now on demand. Where can you see first the all new trailer? For the most anticipated movie of the season, West Side Story. This morning, the trailer premiere. Exclusive only on Good Morning America. Even the best of us get scared. I have felt as if I've been shot out of a cannon. Brave Enough, Amanda Gorman, the Robin Roberts exclusive, tonight on ABC. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Now, with so much hope for a brighter tomorrow, it's time to... Rise and shine. We're traveling all across the country. Celebrate Good Morning America's Great Rise and Shine Tour. The bodies of all nine victims have now been recovered. All of them are being mourned tonight. I have a hard time still believing that my friend and his daughter, that they're gone. I open up our text thread. I'll call his phone. And I just know that he's gone. But man, I, 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 I can't get away from it. Tributes have been pouring in from around the world. The reaction to Kobe Bryant's death was enormous. Everyone was affected by it. 
everyone felt like they knew him and everyone felt that much pain. I mean, I just can't paint for you what it was like, especially in Los Angeles. You know, you go outside Staples Center, there's like thousands of people just walking around like zombies. They came from every age, every gender, every background, every ethnicity. Holding this gigantic memorial tribute to him outside. It wasn't just fans. It was everyone in the city as if they lost their favorite son, and they did. He wasn't just a Laker, he, he represented us. He was L.A. He was a hero, a role model. The thing that hit me the most was the murals that were going up in the city. Then you really start to understand the love affair people had with Kobe Bryant. Then, of course, the memorial came. It was incredibly emotional to hear Michael Jordan speak about Kobe Bryant. When Kobe Bryant died, a piece of me died. I witnessed one of the most heroic things I'd ever seen anyone do. Please welcome Vanessa Bryant. But Vanessa got up there and, and spoke from her heart. Uh, you know, I'm emotional now, just remembering it. <laughs> Mommy, Natalia, Bianca, Capri, and Daddy love you so much, Gigi. We continue to see Vanessa kind of give us all a lesson in grief. The sense of missing some part of yourself that's gone forever remains incredibly vivid. For her, a husband and a daughter. Kobe was the MVP of Girl Dads. He taught them how to be brave and how to keep pushing forward when things get tough. The kind of man that wanted to teach the future generations to be better and keep them from making his own mistakes. Kobe Bryant should have gotten old. He should be at his daughter's college basketball games or WNBA games. That's the thing that got all of LA is that it's Kobe Bryant. It's the Mamba. Mambas don't die. What Kobe has showed us that every day we have an opportunity to impact, we have an opportunity to be great in whatever we do. And that's what Mamba mentality is. Through this ball, I've been able to do so many things. These lessons that I've learned through the game will be with me forever. He's not just a great scorer or a great basketball player. He became a great person. His legacy is the journey, this rocky, turbulent, tumultuous journey, ending up in such a shining, great place, and then just stopping. His legacy is a journey unfinished. And you can look yourself in the mirror and say, did I do everything possible to try to get better? If the answer is yes, let the dust settle where it may. now and America this morning the best new video the breaking news overnight emergency crews called to the town of Surfside US airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria the stories people are talking about you don't want to shave your legs don't I was gonna say, oh my Got it. and what to expect in the day ahead ABC World News now and America this morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern up all night to keep you up to date it was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, 
No Bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Now, with so much hope for a brighter tomorrow, it's time to... Rise and shine. We're traveling all across the country. Celebrate Good Morning America's Great Rise and Shine Tour. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime. Cinematic. Real-life drama. Stunning. The unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime. 2020, now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon. 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Please begin. This is the testimony of Elizabeth Holmes. The Stanford dropout who appeared poised to change the world, but didn't. Her fall from grace was spectacular. Elizabeth is finally going to trial. This case will probably go down in Silicon Valley history. But to this day, Elizabeth maintains her innocence. We'll take you inside the courtroom. If history is any indication, Elizabeth Holmes is not going down without a fight. Follow the dropout Elizabeth Holmes on trial wherever you get your podcasts. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Even the best of us get scared. Something kind of magical happened when I stepped up to the podium. I have felt as if I've been shot out of a cannon. Rolling. She rocked the inauguration and inspired millions. Now, finally, the Amanda Gorman you don't know. And how does Amanda answer this? I wouldn't be here where I am today if I hadn't been so brave enough, Amanda Gorman, the Robin Roberts exclusive, Wednesday night on ABC. Let's talk about OnlyFans. The Instagram, but for porn. OnlyFans is massively a part of the pop culture zeitgeist right now. OnlyFans has definitely enabled us to call the shots. Anyone can come in from the ground floor and start making money. A lot of celebrities joining OnlyFans. Cardi B, Chris Brown. Bella Thorne. Within 24 hours, she made $1 million. You either love me or you hate me. Think of it as like an online playground. OnlyFans, selling sexy, exclusively on Hulu. Now, with so much hope for a brighter tomorrow, Filled with sunshine, it's time to rise and shine. And we're celebrating by hitting the road. Right, let's let's do it. Traveling all across the country. Oh my gosh. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. <laughs> Let it shine. Let it shine. Yes, it's time to celebrate and smile with Good America. Good America. It's ABC's Good Morning America's Great Rise and Shine Tour. Good morning, America. See the all-new trailer for West Side Story this morning exclusive only on Good Morning America breaking overnight on World News Now the massive tropical storm slowing to a crawl over the Gulf Coast